I don't say gamers. So if you, um, this is the second part of a two-part series because uh, I honestly thought that we would have time to talk about uh, Matt Finch's book. And uh, if you haven't heard me talk about Matt Finch's Old School Primer book, uh, go, go ahead and watch that one first. Or watch this one first. I don't think it really makes any order. But I did start that original broadcast with the intention of trying to get through uh, both books, which me knowing me and the way that I speak, yeah, I knew that was an overreach, even as I tried to do it. But, you know, you have to grasp for, for things you know are out of your reach, or, or you just do not get better. So today, we're back for another attempt. And uh, because Chris is not in competition with any other book, the chances of it getting at least partially read are 100%. So this is the old, um, it's not the old, that was the other one. This is called The Role-Playing Game Primer and Old School Playbook by Chris Goneman, who, as I mentioned last time, is the primary author of Basic Fantasy Role-Playing Game, and uh, but is also quite a fine author, has a number of books for sale through Amazon, and uh, more recently, I guess, created uh, Iron Falcon, which is a uh, retro clone of uh, original D&D. So, but let's have a look. Uh, all that to say... <laughs> You know, a very qualified person to write a book uh, to give us some insight as to how uh, how things were back in the day and how they should be now to have a different kind of gaming experience. So, so I want to just do a quick flyby, a quick uh, page through, and just have a look. And. Uh, as in a lot of my favorite publications, he's he's chosen to start right off the bat with an example of play. And for someone that's coming to the game for the first time that's doesn't know what that sort of interaction sounds like and um, wonders how formal it is or, or what that exchange sounds like, beginning with an example like this is the best thing in the world. Um, it's the next best thing, I guess, to just being thrown in, in cold water, but, you know, this is probably a lot less traumatic because you can read you know, what that exchange sounds like. You know, how turn order works, what to roll, you know, what to do when you don't know what to do and how to ask that question and to see examples here where uh, recent brand new players, who knows, are, are asking what they need to do in order to get things accomplished. Because old school, I don't think... Uh, you don't have to know all the rules. You just have to be a curious person that likes to solve puzzles. And if you can be that sort of person, you can learn the mechanics as you go. And you can ask questions as you go. So, love this. Love it. <laughs> you meet in a tavern. Uh, classic trope. I have to say, though, um, I, I tease affectionately. I'm, I'm in games where, where a tavern is still sort of the center of business. I, my character in one adventure for sure, one campaign I should say, because it's been multiple adventures, has a favorite tavern. Uh, will rather stay at this particular location with its staff and its accommodations rather than any other tavern. And we even have a semi-private dedicated meeting space uh, that we can use almost on demand uh, on the premises. So uh, yeah, I don't know. So I can't make fun. I, I, I love a good tavern as much as the next uh, adventurer. Okay. So I'm not, uh, as is my custom, I'm not going to read. I, I may read some some bits, but for the most part, I I'd, uh, I uh, I implore you to go and, and download this. Uh, in the first part of the video, I linked to both Chris's book and to Matt Finch's book, and I intend to do the same with this when it's published, which will be soon. Um, I don't intend to ever do a lot of uh, editing to my stuff. I just don't have the time or the talent. There are there are plenty of excellent YouTubers who, who I, I deeply respect who are much better at it uh, than I am. And uh, Wes Allen, who's uh, at DM Tales, probably my favorite. Um, yeah, you want something that's polished and beautiful, that's the guy to go to. You're gonna get it. Uh, you're getting it raw from me. Anyway, so all right. So 
the first part is entirely just uh, some some sample back and forth there just so you get a sense of well what 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 does that feel like what will my first time be like how does the how does the turn order move around and and what do i do when it's my turn and what do i ask if i don't know what to do so it's uh, it's nothing to worry about you figure it out as you go along even the beginning uh, dungeon masters um I've heard it said, with increasing regularity from people around my age group, that none of us knew what we were doing when we started playing it, and even the people running the game as Dungeons and Masters didn't know what they were doing. Um, I think that's how house rules begin. You try to read these rules to the best of your ability and implement them to the best of your ability, but you also just you accidentally break things or, or make other decisions as you go. and. Uh, yeah, that becomes your house game. Anyway, Chris's advice, have fun. It, it is a game. And what I've said, don't be afraid to ask questions. Don't feel like you're being stupid. Uh, don't feel like uh, like it's not okay to uh, ask for things to be repeated. Um, if you've watched my Christ Sogan's Coterie one-hour blah, blah fest, uh, I talk a little bit about my background. I'm uh, I come from social work, and uh, between my personal experience within myself and interacting with other people, and just uh, being a player of uh, role playing games, I can say that uh, there are people um, that are on the spectrum. There are people with attention problems, and uh, even though uh, and, and I include myself uh, in that group. Um, you can still love a thing, but still have this tendency to kind of, you know, lose focus or be distracted every now and then. And chances are you're probably among good company. People will be patient and kind and, uh, you know, never be afraid to get uh, to ask questions or, or to get reoriented to, to ask, well, oh, uh, what's, what's, uh, what's being asked of me in this moment? All right, try things. This isn't a computer game. Hmm, yeah, so... People trying to apply a video game lens to to how things work, it's it's gonna be you're gonna have to sort of change your mindset a little bit to be successful at this. Don't be a rules lawyer. Yeah, the person running the game, the dungeon master, is game master, referee, it's their game, and again, you'll figure it out as you go along. Uh, make notes. It's good to have at least one player. <laughs> I have a wonderful uh, player who's uh, he does write ups in the channel on roll twenty. Um, after every game and uh, I try to come early to the next game and the first thing that I do is read what he wrote as a summary so that I'm oriented like where did we leave off um, because if you are going to more than one game and I think I've been up to four at a time I'm, I've cut down to three sometimes yeah you need to sort of get that like at the beginning of the te uh, television series there where it's like uh, they give you the, the recap <laughs> I need the recap. I need the recap. Saving throws. What are they? Yeah. Against things like magical spells, poison traps, etc. Um, there are some games that I appreciate, such as um, White Box, a fantastic medieval adventure game that uses just a single saving throw. And ostensibly, because it's based on swords and wizardry, perhaps that's a thing, uh, it's an optional to have uh, one single saving throw for any given unforeseen event, a critical event, or or a number of them broken up into categories depending on what they are. So, yeah, not hard to understand. And, yeah, you'll learn as you do. Mortality. Okay. Characters die. Yeah, I think that makes it, and as I said in part one of the same series, um, the uncertainty is what makes make this a more engrossing, enriching, immersive experience because out of necessity over the last few years, I've had to play a lot of 5e. And um, even though I found some really nice people to play with that I, I, I love, I love, honestly. We, we even saved, started saying it to each other. <laughs> we spend the first 30 minutes just, just chatting because... Uh, um, you can develop lifelong friends in this hobby. 
And uh, even if you're like me, who's moved so many times, has left so many people behind just trying to follow education and career success, um, and didn't really have any friends. That all changed three years ago with COVID when I got back online, realized that there were these amazing virtual tabletop tools, and uh, found the group of people that I'm still with now, that I've jumped from game to game with, um, that we've started our own game with, anyway. Why do I wander this way? My mind goes in a hundred million directions, so, yeah. Anyway, um, facing monsters. I'm trying to make these comparisons between new gaming and, and, and old school gaming, and, uh, yeah, I'm honestly trying to, to do, uh, do you right by, by making these little mental, uh, excursions that I do. But, uh, death... It's, it's, uh, you, you can't be as foolhardy. You can't be as impetuous. You, you cannot just be, oh my God, let's just rush in. That, that is the surest way to get killed in an old school game. And, uh, I don't have to explain it any further because at this point, Mr. Gunnerman is probably going to do a much better job. Um, understand that you won't necessarily win every fight. And losing is a way of being fatal to your character. Absolutely. Um, you cannot have a, short rest like in the D D and, and uh spend some hit dice to, to roll to bring up your uh, your total. And you cannot get like a night's sleep, you know, six hours minimum I think is what it says in the uh player's handbook. And, and wake up completely healed. Yeah. It's not video gamey, you know. It's uh you know, it's that's not absolutely realistic either, but it's it's it tries to be a much closer approximation to how real people, average Joes and Janes, um, heal slowly when they've been badly hurt from from yeah, from an encounter. So run away, uh, bargain with the monster, try to make a deal, pay them off, do whatever you have to do to not die. Um, used ranged weapons, you know, if. Uh, Start your conversation from a distance away. Um, try to, to get something arranged that way. And if it's not going to work, use an arrow, use a sling, throw a dagger, use spells, do something to cause some damage to your enemies before they're within grappling, choking distance of you. Stay out of melee range uh, as, as long as you can. Um, bring a cleric. Bring... Uh, Healing potions. Yeah. Very important. <laughs> Don't split the party. I haven't seen the new D&D movie. Um, I um, still... I'm having some, some very negative feelings about Wizards of the Coast. You know, TSR in its own way was, uh, was its own animal. Um, but it's become more and more of a business. COVID really was excellent for, for some reason. It had got... Grognards like me, who had basically dropped off the earth uh, out of the gaming scene for 30 years or more and got us back behind uh, our keyboards and rolling virtual dice on virtual tables. Uh, but it, it's also made businessmen's uh, and women's and women's uh, eyes light up with dollar signs thinking, we can monetize this. d d is under-monetized. <laughs> Anyway, um, so I didn't see the movie. I don't know if, if keeping the party together is a thing, but it's another trope in the, such the same way that, that you meet at an inn or a tavern is a thing. Keeping the party together, it's, 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 it's a rule. Um, you really need to have all of your people together. And um, it's because the four classes are, are complementary. They each have a different part of an overall... You know, if you took a pie and divided it in quarters, no one's um, piece really intersects with other people's piece in, in the way that uh, for 5e, there are so many, there's so much overlap of skills between characters. It, it I think it loses something. You know, clerics, I, I don't know that they're nearly as important anymore uh, when the short rest and the long rest became a thing. Whereas they were so important, they were vital. You know, you absolutely needed a cleric in your party to to survive in old school, and still do 
if you play it old school. Mapping. Now, I recall from an interview that I saw, a very excellent interview, and maybe remind me to, uh, to link that one also. Um, Chris mentioned that he had a pretty good technique for trying to explain to uh, new mappers how to, uh, how to map. So maybe we'll, uh, we'll take a little bit more time and go through this. So first of all, the GM should tell the player who's mapping what scale the map should be in. This isn't revealing any secrets to the players, it's just making the game easier to play. Most classic dungeon interiors are drawn at one square equals either five feet or ten feet. Uh, me, I always learned ten feet. I don't know what we got ten feet from, but maybe, it's like I said, we were kids, like eight-year-olds, nine-year-olds, <laughs> and uh, we started with advanced. So we had these big, big, thick books. Um, some assumption and some page skipping was probably done. Mistakes were made. So for a map in 10-foot squares, uh, it'll be easiest if you start in the middle of the nearest side of the paper. The stairs are 10 feet wide and run down the north 20 feet. Then the corridor runs 20. Branch left 10 feet to a door, run 10 feet to a door. OK. And then there's examples of, of uh, what's being described, um, like illustrated uh, in the side of the text here. Now, it sounds a little odd, but it's a very efficient way to describe a dungeon. Here's what the player would draw. The player has just assumed north is at the top of the map, which is fine. That's how I think of it, too. I am so ugh, messed up when, uh, when I look and someone has written the letter N on the left side of the map. It's like I instantly just want to rotate it and think... You know, north, south, west, east. So the players just assume that north is at the top of the map, which is fine. The stairs run 20 feet, and then the corridor runs another 20. The next instruction is branch left, which means that the corridor continues onward past the branch. Alternatives would be a crossroads, as in the corridor goes four ways, turns or tees, which means that it goes left and right, but not onwards. Branch, turn, tee, and crossroads always take a space of their own, just as shown. The rest of the instructions finish out, the map is shown, the players decide to try the door to the left, and after they get it open, I, the GM, say, the room is 30 feet deep and 20 feet wide and extends left. And then there's a picture, here's the result. Extends left tells the player how to lay out the room on the map. So from that, I don't know, I see a plumbing pipe there when I look at the first picture there. And uh, now we've added some sort of a reservoir or a basin to it. I do too much home improvement work. Good Lord. Uh, yeah, there's the result. Extends left. So how about a more complicated room? When the players open the other door, I say, start from the left side of the door and follow the wall. Run 10 feet. Turn right. Run 20 feet. Turn right. Run 10 feet. Half turn left, diagonal one square, half turn right, run 10 feet, run, uh, sorry, turn right, run 30 feet, and square it off. So, wow, that sounds complicated, he writes. I am in full agreement. Um, I recall, um, like I said, we were about 10 years old at the time, and completely frustrating our dungeon master, who was also 10 years old at the time, and him periodically just taking the map from us and drawing the thing and then handing it back to us. So we can expect better of our adult selves, though, I think. So let's press on. Mapping can be a chore, but if you do it my way, the Chris Gonerman way, or spend some time working out your own system, it doesn't have to be so bad. Good maps make for good adventures. So if I was a dungeon master, if I had the time for that to be a thing in my life, um, I would go over this page probably with whoever gets the role of mapper. And that's another old school thing. Um, I'm not sure that, that things like uh, mapper and caller um, are roles that are, are divvied out to, uh, to players nowadays. And there was also someone in charge of inventory for treasure and stuff like that. So everyone used to have a separate job on top of just being an adventurer. But... Uh, yeah, I don't know that calling, where you gather up all of the opinions of your fellow PCs in the party and then you deliver what the party is going to do, you're the spokesperson for your group. Yeah, you may not have heard of that. Old school. 
So for those reading this book who plan to be players, you may pretty much think that you're done with it. See, we're already at 23 pages, which is like we're 10 more than what uh, what Matt had in his old school primer. Anyway, but we have learned mapping, which was very important. Uh, that's the value added of this so far. I think I could rely on both of these, and I'll probably read both of these. Uh, you can rely on both of them to give you a good sense of the philosophy of old school, but uh, we're getting some good tools here from Chris, so much appreciated. Uh, who knows, someday you might find yourself being a game master after all. <laughs> Maybe. Not today. Uh, running an adventure. So he's presenting a single dungeon level, which you can use to start your own game. So we've gone from an example of interaction to schooling you on mapping to providing you with uh, an adventure that you can adapt for your own purposes. So, so far, it's, uh, and I don't mean this to be insulting, in the way that uh, Frank Metzer rewrote the most beautiful version of Basic and Expert ever created, the 1981 Basic and Expert box set, he, he redid it to be more friendly, to be more instructive, um, tutorial-like. Um, Chris is, seems to be taking kind of a similar thing here, and it's not a bad thing. I just I really like the 1981 game. Um, I like uh, I like that it was very direct. Um, it made me feel uh, grown up, like it wasn't trying to hold my hand. I'm not sure if uh, we'll be able to see here. It's kind of shiny. Anyway. What I like about this is that it says it's for adults uh, ages 10 and up. So that delighted my young soul. <laughs> Tom Old Bay, rest in peace. You are the best. Yeah, anyway, I digress. So what else is new? Um, so, Wandering Monsters. Encounter check should be rolled every three turns. So Wandering Monsters, not only is that a thing, but uh, I know as a as a dungeon master, I've used it as a tool to encourage the players to keep moving. Which is not to say that you, you know, you can't just, you, you can always run into a monster anywhere. Even if you are being an active party and you're getting stuff done, you're, you're doing your mapping, you're, you're exploring, you're looking for traps, you're finding treasure, you could still just end up face to face in the hallway anyway. But to encourage a game that is, uh, excuse me, that's a problem with this uh, technique where I'm going to minimally edit. You're going to have to listen to that too. Yeah. I'm sorry. Um, to, to get a game moving, sometimes it's good to, uh, to introduce a, a wandering monster just so that, uh, yeah, you, you keep them uh, engaged with something. Really, it makes it fun for both of you, but uh, no one wants their time wasted. Okay, so there's there's an encounter, one d four plus one goblins. So, rolling a uh, a one d four. So you'll generate between what's that six total. Okay, one d four plus one. Okay, so um, from this I would interpret that uh, at any one time there, or for the first encounter, you can. You'll find between two and five your 1d4 plus one goblins, but there are six total. So, hypothetically, if you found all five and killed all five in one encounter, there's still another one that's maybe wandering around somewhere else. So, as a DM, I would take a note of that. I still like to say DM. I know it's Game Master. Ugh. It's a problem when this stuff gets into your brain when you're still young and impressionable. It, it teaches you how to think. It, you know, <laughs> help, help, I've been indoctrinated. All right. Secret rooms. Um, okay, so uh, you can also learn. Yeah. I jumped a bit too much there. Yeah. So it's going to, uh, in the second section here, it teaches you how to read the stat block. Uh, armor class hit dice, number of attacks, damage, movement, save as. Um, because monsters have saving throws too. If you do a spell on them or a, you know, a wand... Uh, or, you know, they, they get a roll to try to save themselves also. You know, morale. Uh, and as I've said before, no one, no intelligent creature probably will fight to the death. In the same way that I'm encouraging you to, you know, not die by figuring out an alternate way to manage that, 
they too, you know, don't really want to die. Believe it or not, they're not sitting there, you know, twiddling their thumbs. I wonder when they're going to show up and kill us. No. <laughs> okay, crab spider. Uh, I'm. We're gonna. We're gonna jump through here. So the box text, which I haven't mentioned so far, that is a technique um, to make it very visually clear to the dungeon master what information you can read verbatim to the players, or what information can you share in your own words to the players. And uh, the reason that, that this has been formatted in this way is that, um, you know, you have to prep. You have to do some prep for, uh, for an adventure. But actually, sometimes you don't have the time to prep. Sometimes um, some of your players don't show up and you decide to do a one-shot with, and maybe the material is something you're not familiar with, and uh, in that case, it's very, very convenient to have it spelled out for you, or in this case, you know, drawn around. What are the things that I can tell the players? And uh, if you do enough practicing with reading, you can maybe even get away with reading the, the uh, box text and make it sound like it's your own words and not like I am reading the words off the page. The tower is a little bit more than a shell, but inside you can see the rubble and brush has been cleared away from a staircase, which descends into darkness. So, Cold reading is a good skill for a dungeon master. I picked it up uh, working in radio, where I would have to read the news every hour. And, uh, yeah, rather than embarrass myself at the top of the hour, I learned, I, I practiced a lot of reading. Just cold, cold reading. I'd pick up anything, a magazine, a recipe, a piece of paper on the table, and try to read it as fluidly and as comfortably like they were my very own words. Uh, it's, a, it's a good skill. So, Goblin Party. So, in between and around these boxed text sections is other information which is known only to you as the Dungeon Master. Secret Room, Pit Trap. Okay, and there's a, a level one map. So, for every level, up, up if you're going a tower, down if you're going at a dungeon, um, they will be identified this way. And look, look, north is at the top there, so I can actually understand it. Very cool. Okay, and a legend. Uh, door, it's a... Uh, you can see that it, 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 it go, extends from both sides of the, the line, which is the wall. False door only goes on the one side. And S indicates a secret door. And this is one of the reasons why you don't want to do the mapping for your players. Um, or in the very least, if you're going to give them a map or, or bits of a map at a time, you need to have a copy of your own map so that things like the pit trap and the secret door are not on their copy of the map. So it's, uh, it's up to them to do a good job of searching to try to find these hidden features of the rooms you've created. Okay. So there's a short dungeon adventure. Uh, how to create your own adventure. Um, starting with someone else's pre-made one is, is a great way to learn what all the parts are and how you might want to make one yourself. And uh, you can even use one as, as you're sitting down drafting your own ideas. You know, just flip through. Flip through the one uh, as an example to see, well, okay, so they did this and they had these elements, so I need to have these elements also. You know, but then feel free to use your reaction to that adventure as a player or as a dungeon master to improve on it, to add things, to delete things in a way that uh, yeah, makes what you're creating both a better thing for you, but possibly also a better thing for other people. And then maybe you could go to a, a website such as basicfantasy.org and share your work uh, in the forum. Okay. Stalking the dungeon. So, yeah. Monsters have treasure types. You don't have to come up with stuff, uh, you know, completely on your own. It's, it's, uh, there are charts for such things. Uh, random generation for uh, what's in a room. Okay, this is a level two key. We have monsters and stat blocks. And uh, there's some explanatory text here from Chris um, with the lines next to it to explain you know, what he's doing and why. Yeah. 
So, okay, rule zero. <laughs> we did discuss this uh, with Matt uh, Matt Finch's uh, in part one of this uh, video series, uh, limited to, unless I can find a third book that uh, that's a good introduction for old school play. So rule zero, and I mentioned this, the game master is always right. Do not be a rules lawyer. Um, even Gary Gygax said that it's up to the uh, it's up to the uh, DM to play play the game to define the rules the way that they choose to do them. And uh, yeah, even he didn't play Advanced Dungeons and Dragons as written. So uh, do not be an arguer, and uh, do not let players argue with you. Um, it's your universe; you run it the way you want to. Okay. Uh, a glossary, I guess. Terminology. It says adventure. For us grognards, we may use the word module. Because what a strange word. But again, it got into our brains when we were young and impressionable. And it still lives there 40 years later. Or longer. Okay. Scene building shorthand. I'm a proponent of the fast and loose method of campaign world development. The more you write down, the more things you create that your players will never see or appreciate. So yeah, don't over-prepare. Have a, have a 10,000 foot view of what your world is like. And then, but but don't micromanage. Do not create minutia. Um, figure out what you're doing as you're doing it based on how you imagine the overall world and the things in it. Um, if you have uh, an idea of what your world is, of course it'll be obvious to you what the thing is that's in the location that the players happen to go to, rather than pre-populated with all these things that they will never see. Silly. Anyway, using miniatures. Hmm. Lots of good videos on how to do that. You don't have to make them. Uh, you don't have to, or you don't have to buy them. You can make them. Uh, some people use pennies. Some people use bingo chips. Uh, there are plenty of uh, printable ones that you can fold like little tent card style. Me, I use, um, I saw a video where a guy, he took uh, one inch fridge magnets, like round discs, uh, then used a, a, a color inkjet printer to make a bunch of pictures that he'd gotten off the internet. Uh, there's a round one inch hole punch that you can get from Fiskars, which I purchased. And there are also one inch uh, gel domes, uh, little rounded tops, and basically you take your magnet, it's, it's got a sticky thing you can pull off, stick on your picture there, after you've uh, punched that at exactly one inch uh, circular with, uh, with your puncher, and then take the, the, the peel off the, uh, the little gel window dome and stick that on top there, and you've got, hmm, maybe I can even show you one. I'm gonna make a mess. All right, there we go. This is what I speak of here. And uh, hmm. anyway, it's a lovely dwarf woman, and uh, it looks pretty shiny on top there. That the gel, it's it's not as soft as it might suggest, but uh, it's also I don't think it's as scratchy as as a like a hard plastic would be, and it's quite thick. And it could be magnetic, should you wish. Um, but I mostly got it just for the weight. Anyway, and uh, they fit nicely. And uh, I think uh, I went to Dollarama, and I buy super glue there on a regular basis. There's like four to a tube. Uh -uh. But uh, it's an excellent little uh, free holder for, uh, for my tokens that I made. So, yeah, miniatures make them. Oh my gosh, we're going to get through this. We're going to get through this. I'm so proud of myself and it's only, okay, it's 35 minutes, so I'm not so proud of myself. Actually, I, I, I spent 35 minutes just doing Matt's 13-page book, so take it back. I am proud of myself. Other games, so because Chris is the author of uh, Basic Fantasy RPG or BFRPG, um, there are other retro clones. I mentioned one already, uh, White Box. Fantastic medieval adventure game, which, uh, like uh, Chris's uh, Iron Falcon, is an, an OD&D clone, original D&D clone. 
Osric. Osric. So, and if you watch the first video, you'll know that that was originally penned by Matt Finch. Uh, he did the first draft, but uh, he had some health issues, which uh, he's been, I think he's been very open about. And uh, he handed the stuff over to Stuart Marshall, who functioned as the editor to get that out the door. Um, it's it, uh, At the time that it was published, uh, there were some concerns that perhaps uh, they might be in some legal danger. So some things like attributes, like there's no percentage strength for fighters. It goes from 18 to 19, and I know that causes some, some stress. Um, and some of the charts, the numbers have been just slightly altered in a way that uh, lawyers couldn't say, that is exactly the same numbering system used in this book by this company, whoever owns it this week. Hasbro. <clears throat> anyway, I love it. Love it. I would pull it out and show it to you, but I, uh, I keep all of my books in little treasure chests. Well, they're plastic file boxes, to be honest, but uh, I don't keep them on. Uh, I don't keep them on shelves impressively, like like many other people do. Uh, I take them out when I need them, and I put them back and protect them when I do not. Anyway, Osric, lovely. Bought it in a hardcover at some expense because I'm Canadian, and uh, it's not cheap to get stuff shipped to Canada. Um, yeah. I also bought the first edition, or the third edition, sorry, my first one that I purchased of uh, Basic Fantasy. Before it was available in hardcover through uh, uh, through Amazon in Canada, I, I paid Lulu to print that also. I, I got them both at the same time, and I was such a happy camper. Still love both those books dearly. But Osric is an advanced D&D thing, so if you don't have to, don't have the money to pony up the dough to get the uh, those books from my first edition, three books, they're all in one in the Osric tome. Get it. Labyrinth Lord is another BX uh, retro clone. Swords and Wizardry is an uh, original D&D retro clone. Um, and, uh, yeah, White Box was based on Swords and Wizardry White Box. Converting game materials. So, uh, old style used a descending armor class, where the lower the number, including negative numbers, you know, the, the more resistant you were to damage. And uh, ascending AC is a lovely thing, which I'm glad that exists and has been folded into a lot of modern retro clones, either as the default or as an option. Um, so, Osric uses uh, descending AC. Well, they're the exception, I guess. Uh, okay, Swords and Wizardry uses both systems. Uh, Basic Fantasy uses uh, or ascending, ascending AC. Anyway, um, with Basic Fantasy, it's magic number 20. So if you have a descending armor class, subtract that from 20, and that's your ascending armor class. So armor class 3 in, old, uh, in Basic would be uh, 17. For, for basic fantasy. And you can also do it the other way. If you have a basic fantasy adventure that you want to run with, with the original uh, or, or basic expert D&D, um, and if the monster is AC 15, well, that's AC 5. So not, not hard at all. Uh, movement, I told you how important that is to me. Morale, yes, it's a thing that's kind of ignored. I have a separate video about that that's uh, coming up soon. I'm trying to plan out in advance. I'm going to try to make a, I actually did not intend to be a YouTuber, and I probably, I'm not promising anything, but right now I've got a month of material um, queued up in the uh, the chamber. Alignment, that's been dispensed of in, uh, in basic fantasy, and for the better, I think. But anyway, and that's it. That is it. Lovely. Anyway, I will say no more. I will leave links to this and to match product, and uh, yeah. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Matt and Chris, for making wonderful things to teach people. And, and to remind other grognards, uh, you know, things that we may have forgotten in 30 years of not playing. Okay. Be well.